the outside, uh, from an outside observer's point of view, it seems that the aviation industry is not just facing major challenges, but is undergoing radical change, has maybe come even to a turning point. As with so many aspects of economic life, uh, COVID-19 and the downturn of air traffic by around about 90% and the ongoing but louder demand to decarbonize flying, the industry needs to jump innovate. We'll be hearing both vision and strategy from the heads of two of the most important OEMs in commercial aviation. And I say that in alphabetical order from Airbus and Boeing. So greetings to you, Guillaume Fouy, uh, who CEO of Airbus, who has actually come here to the stage um, in the Meistersaal. And also greetings to you, Michael Arthur, president of Boeing International. We are, Sir Michael will have our interview in a moment, uh, but first, ladies and gentlemen, we will hear the keynote intervention by Guillaume Fourie, CEO, Airbus. Please take it away, and then we'll have a quick chat. Vielen Dank. Meine sehr geehrten Damen und Herren, vielen Dank für Ihre herzliche Begrüßung. Ich freue mich wirklich außerordentlich, heute persönlich hier in Berlin sein zu können. I hope you're all uh, safe and well. In 2020, every month seems to bring uh, developments of uh, historic significance. In November alone, we've seen the election of a new US president, fresh uh, lockdowns, and uh, news of uh, vaccines for the COVID-19. An effective vaccine would indeed be wonderful news for humanity and provide a path to recovery for our industry. But it's clear that this winter will be challenging. It will be challenging for health authorities fighting the virus, but also for businesses trying to contain the devastating economic damage. I will briefly touch on the state of play in the aviation industry before turning to uh, the so-called aircraft systems of the future. Actually, it's important that we do focus on the future uh, because European aerospace can lead the industry beyond this crisis with advances in connectivity and sustainable aviation. For now, and it was said several times already uh, today, our industry is living through its gravest crisis, worse than SARS, September 11, and the global financial crisis combined. We consider that the air traffic is unlikely to return to its pre-crisis level before 2023 and potentially not until 2025. It gives an indication of the gravity of this crisis. Therefore, the support of our government and governmental partners remains critical, not least here in Germany. I'd like to thank them for their help so far. Indeed, as we confront confront this uh, crisis at Airbus, our non-commercial aviation businesses, I mean our defense, space, and helicopter divisions, are providing to be a welcome source of resilience. Three weeks ago, the German parliament confirmed a major order for 38 Eurofighters to replace some of its existing fleet. This so-called Quadriga aircraft will be equipped with advanced radars, technologies, and many other innovations. Then last week, the Bundestag confirmed the German Navy's order for 31 NH-90 type multi-role frigate helicopters. All this will help preserve Europe's status as a center of aerospace skill, skills and technologies. But for the aviation sector, the most important step to recovery will be, has to be, the swift resumption of air travel and reopening of international borders. While news about a vaccine is encouraging, regulatory approval is pending, and distributing a vaccine will undoubtedly take time. Our industry still faces a very difficult path ahead. So what is urgently needed is a uniform approach to reopening borders, testing passengers, and having a set of common and predictable rules to see passengers back in the air. 
this is now overdue. And other regions of the world are doing better than what we see, unfortunately, here in Europe. Applying common standards here could be, should be the basis of a globally coordinated response. It's vital, indeed, that aviation emerges from this crisis, wounded, but alive. Because our industry can make a powerful contribution after the pandemic, supporting the recovery and prosperity, unifying people across borders, and underpinning multilateralism. Aircraft systems of the future. And I start with connectivity. In European aerospace, we have indeed the opportunity to continue to shape the future of aviation. It will probably be defined by innovations in aircraft systems surpassing anything in the history of aerospace. At Airbus, we see connectivity and sustainability as being at the core of the vision for the future. We've already seen impressive advances on connectivity in the industry, but we believe the most ambitious project of all in that field is in defense, and it's the future combatter systems known as the FCAS. This system, this FCAS, is being developed by France, Germany, Spain, Airbus, Dassault, and other European partners, and it's expected to be ready in sort of two decades' time. It's the project of a generation. FCAS will be a smart, intelligent, and connected sort of systems, of systems linking planes, satellites, drones, ships, helicopters, remote carriers, you name it. And for the first time at that scale, all Europe's defense assets can be connected on one European cloud platform. The armed forces will have real-time information about all areas of the, uh, the military space, the military activity. FCAS will also strengthen Europe's technological and defense sovereignty, equipping it with leading capabilities in cyber, cyber security, cyberspace, ground-to-air connectivity, and other areas. This matters in a world of geopolitical tensions and rivalry. But FCAS could and will probably also support major advances in the civil sector. One example is digitalization, because a combat cloud would provide capabilities for a European data infrastructure and cloud architecture. Other examples are new materials, propulsion systems, which might also shape or contribute to shape the next generation of civil aircraft. The project has made excellent progress with the first phase, the demonstrator phase, uh, and, and, the first, um, and the demonstrator phase is now well underway. With our partners, we're focusing on the project's main technological challenges, including the combat cloud and a new generation of fighter aircraft. So how will we realize our vision for the uh, FCAS, for the future combat air system? Well, political and industrial cooperation are essential. In the European aerospace, we are at our best when we pull together in support of a common cause as we've done throughout Airbus history. And our common cause should be a globally competitive European defense program. When it comes to industrial cooperation in action, a great example is Germany's recent uh, Eurofighter order. Thanks to Germany's commitment in the Eurofighter program, we now know this aircraft will be part of FCAS in the 2040s. And this provides much needed certainty as uh, Airbus plans for the future. That brings me to the other core element of our European aviation future, sustainability. In recent years, the environment has shot up the agenda with some calling for curbs on commercial aviation to limit CO2 emissions. The aviation industry must address public concerns as a priority. The industry has already committed to reducing its emissions in line with the Paris Agreement objective of limiting global warming below 2 degrees. But at Airbus, we want clearly 
and boldly to lead the decarbonization in the entire sector. We intend to build the world's first zero emission airliner by 2035, which will likely be fueled by hydrogen. What are the main challenges? Actually, there are many. Um, I, I take three of them. The first one will obviously be to develop and manufacture an aircraft powered by liquid hydrogen propulsion systems. With the level of safety we are used to have now in commercial aviation. Such systems are to a large extent already in use in other sectors, in other Airbus products, in space, satellites, rockets, but also now more and more in automotive industry, for instance. In adapting the technologies to commercial aircraft, we are focusing on performance, reliability, weight reduction, safety. We recently unveiled three concept designs for this aircraft, two based on current turboprop and turbofan aircraft designs, and one on a new um, concept, a new shape resembling what we call a flying wing. We're confident we'll be able to launch a zero emission program in around 2027, 2028, so that commercial operations can begin in 2035. And that brings me to the second challenge. At the same time, we need to work with the regulatory authorities to develop the regulatory framework, the safety standards for flying and hydrogen powered aircraft and operating those airplanes on, on um, airports. And the third um, challenge is beyond the aircraft itself, is a bigger challenge with the mass production of uh, decarbonized hydrogen, of green hydrogen the fuel that is still in its infancy. This is hydrogen extracted using electrolyzers powered by electricity generated from renewables. And this is a much broader challenge uh, than, than the one of the commercial aviation sector itself. That's in contrast to the standard approach of using natural gas to extract hydrogen, which results in substantial CO2 emissions. Scaling up green hydrogen and I will come to the end. Scaling up green hydrogen will require a true coalition between the aviation sector, governments, the EU, and uh, the entire energy industry. Ultimately, green hydrogen growth will depend on the rapid expansion of renewable electricity capacity. At a European level, aviation we should, be, should be included in the EU's hydrogen strategy and roadmap, setting our clear objectives for the rest of this decade. At Airbus, we are working with airlines and airports to make hydrogen available for all ground transport in airports during this decade. The aim is to prepare ourselves for the entry into service uh, of the plane at a later stage. But of course, I recognize there is intense pressure to reduce aviation emissions today. And there are many solutions available. So I must thank the German government for the green stimulus uh, for airline by encouraging the uptake of new fuel efficient aircraft. This will improve aviation's environmental performance while also supporting the manufacturers and the whole supply chain. Improved air traffic management would make a difference too. And I will cut short. So progress on the, on the project, on those projects during the German EU Council presidency will be welcome. In conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, we are meeting at a difficult time. I hope our industry will continue to receive the government support necessary to navigate through this crisis. And I think many stakeholders have said it very clearly. But remember the optimistic saying, the darkest hour comes just before dawn. So yes, these are tough times. We have entered an era of remarkable innovation and European aerospace is leading the way. Thank you. I look forward to um, some very, questions. Very, very, very brief question, uh, simply because we're slightly over the time. So uh, just a very brief question on 2020, uh, 2035, uh, when you have planned to have your first uh, hydrogen plane on the road or on the tarmac, uh, and hopefully in the air then, of course. Um, at the moment, it seems that the question of green hydrogen is the one uh, that will be the decisive point, certainly from the environmental point of view. 
Um, what's your take? Is there going to be enough green hydrogen? Well, the challenge is to have a decarbonized plane. So there would be no point in investing tens of billions of dollars or euros to develop such a plane and not be able to fuel the plane with decarbonized uh, source of energy, be it hydrogen or anything else. Well, I think what, what we're touching here is not the transformation of aviation, is the transformation of the human society. We aviation are 1.6% of the needs uh, for energy on Earth, and 80% of the energy today comes from fossil fuels. So the challenge is indeed uh, the transformation into a decarbonized primary source of energy. That's a challenge for all societies, that's a challenge for energy-intensive societies, but we have 15 years. So if we start now, uh, we have good reasons to believe in 2027 or 2028 that we'll be there for 2035. And um, I think it's, we need to have the roadmap. We have more and more debates with political stakeholders in the industry and the uh, energy sector on how to make this happen. Everybody is engaging. It's a teamwork at the end. Exactly. It's a cooperation. It has to be a cooperation. Lovely. Thank you very much for having been here and also answering the question. And with that, uh, I'd like to invite uh, Sir Michael, um, Michael Arthur, president of Boeing, uh, who has joined us. Uh, and I know that you've got a very sweet spot for Germany simply because you've been here for quite a number of years uh, as ambassador. Now, this is um, probably a good day for you. And uh, I just need to ask you very briefly, um, were you happy with the news uh, that uh, EASA is probably going to readmit uh, the 737 MAX uh, as from January onwards? Also, zuerst für die Einladung. Und es tut mir wirklich leid, dass ich heute nicht in Berlin bei Ihnen sein kann. Aber uh, trotzdem, vielleicht im nächsten Jahr könnten wir das machen. To your question, thank you very much for that. Yes, it's, um, it's great news that EASA has given its provisional airworthiness directive today. It follows the FAA doing that last week. So, uh, so um, I, I think we can see the beginning now of the end of that road. We'll have the MAX flying uh, very soon. I hope even before the end of the year in the United States. I mean, if I could just pick up on some of the points made in the conference so far, I think we're all agreed that this is a really tough time for the industry. And we're talking two years, three years of a valley we've got to get through. But like Richard just now, I mean, we're seeing strong signs of future growth in this industry 10 years, 20 years out. And look at what's happening on internal flights now inside China, inside Korea, inside Japan. And Korea in October flew more flights internally than last year. So, as various people have said, the appetite is there. And as soon as we can get the vaccines and the safe travel, uh, confident travelers, uh, we'll be back in the air uh, big time. There's a huge pent up demand there. We've just got to get through this valley together. And that's my sort of key message to you all. Hold hands and we'll get through that. Uh, oh, I lost uh, it. You, ha you don't hear me? Are you, yeah, yeah, okay, fine. Um, uh, we've just heard uh, Guillaume Fourier, uh, who just had to leave uh, so that there is no conversation between you, which is rather sad, uh, sort of pinpoint uh, to a couple of uh, challenges uh, and uh, innovations they are planning for the next couple of years. Uh, now, whilst there are two continents and uh, whilst there are sort of two different strategies, the challenges out there are very similar. Um, so. Under what conditions do you see the future of Boeing operating as it had been before? And let's sort of, you know, make brackets uh, around uh, um, the, 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 the short uh, episode of uh, the 737 MAX. Well, I mean, first on what uh, Guillaume Fauré was saying about uh, innovation and technology, I mean, we're all doing that uh, too. He mentioned a lot about defence. We're testing in Australia at the moment something called the Loyal Wingman, the air, air teaming system, which is a next generation type of uh, operation. So there's a very exciting amount of innovation and research going on in the uh, aerospace area. In fact, actually in Germany, we have one of our global centers of research down in, in Munich working on this sort of uh, material. But your question, I think, is primarily about um, sustainability and a, a greener aviation and it's incumbent on us all 
to make aviation more sustainable. Uh, we have just last month, uh, last uh, a couple of months ago, appointed a chief sustainability officer at executive council level. He's coming to your panel tomorrow, Chris Raymond, to talk about these, these issues. I mean, we put a huge amount of effort and work into this. I mean, for example, and we're sort of doing this step by step. Uh, Guillaume Fauquet was talking very ambitiously about hydrogen in 2035. Well, we may all get there. The safety issues are pretty challenging, but um, let's aim high. But we want to build things step by step. So if you take a Dreamliner, the 787 flying today, I mean, that is 25% more efficient than the planes that are it's, it, it, the existing planes of that size that it's replacing. The key in this is sustainable aviation fuel, because that's the big driver for uh, CO2 reduction. And we can fly planes today with that. We've tried that with the eco demonstrator that we do 100% on sustainable aviation fuel, but it's very expensive. And so the challenge for the industry, and I'm talking energy industry as well as aviation industry, is to get that cost down so that the consumers are happy to pay uh, the price that they, they want to pay. And we're all working on that. But it is technically possible now. That's my encouraging message to you. Um, now, um, just assuming that we've got a vaccine um, and that hydrogen is a bit off. You just said uh, the sustainable uh, aviation fuels were the sort of interim. Um, by what time do you think needs to be the crossover, i.e. the phase out of one and the set on of the other? Have you set yourself a goal? Well, I mean, we are phasing that in all the time. We, you can mix um, sustainable fuel, biofuels with conventional jet fuels now. Some airlines choose to do that. Part of the challenge there, apart from the cost, is the distribution. So we need to scale that globally. And I think across the world, we're seeing that the Chinese are looking at this too. Uh, we're all looking at how we can move faster down that path. I mean, I mentioned fuels as the single biggest sort of near-term uh, change agent. But the other area we're doing a lot of work on is the digital uh, aviation, because if you can make planes fly more efficiently, less fuel consumption, less time in the air, less circling, all those sorts of things that digital aviation can help with, that will help save carbon dioxide emissions as well. And actually, again, back in Germany, we have in Frankfurt, one of our biggest centers for digital research in the world. We've got 500 people in Frankfurt working on digital aviation techniques. So there's plenty of excitement out there coming along. And for the climate side, i.e. sort of which fuel to take, um, uh, we've seen it in the automobile industry uh, that a couple of OEMs got together and uh, they developed a hybrid uh, engine. And, and then, of course, they branded it in a way. Um, so how much co-opetition is going on um, in your, uh, well, with you and the co-competitor in the market? Well, I mean, first on the hybrid, I think that is absolutely the right path forward. And we've also, like Airbus, tested electric planes. But, you know, the power that you can generate doesn't get a big plane off the ground uh, in the way you need. So there's more work to be done on that. And some hybrid work will maybe the way forward. Our chief technology officer, um, uh, Greg Heislop, is on this uh, conference, I think, later today. And you might want to get him to talk more detail uh, on that. As to cooperation and competitors, well, in the defence field, it's quite interesting how often we both compete and cooperate. And indeed, um, Airbus and we cooperate in one or two areas in, in that uh, sort of support structures for that. Um, on uh, getting confident travelling back globally, this is, a nation, this is an industry-wide challenge. We, with the ICAO, I mean, Airbus, Boeing, Embraer uh, and Bombardier, we're all holding hands, basically, to try and convince the traveling public that inside an aeroplane is now very safe uh, because of the way we all handle uh, the air control, air, air flow inside the, the fuselage, the uh, high efficiency uh, um, air, which we, 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 it's 99% um, safe inside a plane. And that's all of us trying to do, do that. So there's lots of um, joint work on the sort of wider market we're pretty fiercely competitive uh, on everything else. Pretty fiercely competitive, <laughs> but that's healthy for the consumer. 
the last two minutes and maybe sort of, you know, throw out a, a couple of ideas. 2050 is a time when aviation is dot, dot, dot. Oh, aviation will be, uh, I mean, moving people across the world, I mean, across countries, will be uh, vastly more efficient than it is now. It will be much faster. And the volume of people doing that will be enormous. I mean, I think it's 80% of the world have yet to set foot in an aeroplane. The growing young population in uh, Asia uh, and other parts of the world desperately wants to be flying. So we will be moving them through the air in a much more efficient way than we have done hitherto. Exactly which technologies we'll be using then, I, I hesitate to guess. That's a long way ahead and a lot of work to be done by very clever people between now and then. But there's lots of it coming. You to look into the uh, sort of uh, into the crystal ball uh, and and spinning off on that uh, would that transportation be in big planes as you were saying actually they are um, ecologically a bit more efficient than the other ones but uh, is the demand not going to change uh, very much away from that uh, from the like 800 900 people in a plane to small snazzy um, feeder air ports, uh, air, airplanes. I mean, I think it's quite interesting, Richard made the point uh, uh, earlier, that increasingly people um, want to fly point to point, uh, and we're now seeing that with, uh, you know, a modern uh, 777 or a 787 from Boeing, you can fly from Australia to, to London in one hop. It's a very long journey, but you could do that. And I think the future is going to be not the super big planes. I mean, both the uh, Boeing 747 and the Airbus 380 are now being retired. Four engine planes are being, being retired. So my guess is that the sort of large planes we've got now, the 777X we're just bringing on, is about where we will stay in terms of large planes. And there'll be a whole range of options beneath that space, uh, size, which will do point to, increasingly point-to-point -point flights. I think that is the way the market is moving. Thank you so much, uh, Sir Michael, um, and thank you very much for taking my invitation to look uh, at the future very much, uh, because only if you have a vision for the future can you sort of re-engineer uh, for the next couple of days uh, and weeks and months, and uh, we're going to continue with years. Now, um, of course, we're going to go into a bit more concrete examples with the CTOs, with the technicians uh, of both the companies, Airbus uh, and Boeing, and a moment. Uh, but for now, thank you very much for having given us the time. Thank you.